på nogle af de her spørgsmål, der opstår. I kan følge med i vores arbejde på www.apolitik.dk eller på vores Facebook-side CKA-Center for Kristne og Politik. Så hvis nogle af jer synes, det er spændende og relevant, så må I endelig gå derind og finde det. Vi har også taget nogle folder med i aften, hvor I kan læse lidt mere om, hvad vi har gang i. Og noget af det, vi ellers satser på, det er både at gøre skældende akademisk og gøre skældende folkeligt. Lige nu er vi i i gang med at skrive PhD tilknyttet Center for Kristne og Politik. Og så vil vi rigtig gerne ud og holde en masse foredrag og tale om politik og holde nogle debatter. Så hvis I synes, det kunne være spændende i den sammenhæng, hvor I er i, så tag ind i fat i også og hør mulighederne og skriv til os efterfølgende. I aften skal vi være sammen om øh, det her emne med opstandelsen, og om Jesus virkelig er opstået fra de døde. Og det er Kurt Christensen, som er vores alfader i Center for Kristne og Politik, der skal præsentere mig i den Så giv ham en stor hånd. Så I får den på engelsk her. Det skal der foregå. Det har vi annonceret på engelsk. Så. From a certain point of view, you can say that Christian, Christianity is founded on two pillars. First, that God is the creator of heaven and earth. And secondly, that Jesus rose from the dead. If this is the case, our belief is according to, to Paul and 1 Corinthians 15, empty. Tonight we will focus on this second topic. Did Jesus really rise from the dead? And in this connection it is a great pleasure and an honor for me to welcome you, Professor De Kona. Where are you sitting? Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, Mike Lekone is uh, in Denmark for the first time. Um, he's a professor in the New Testament at Houston Baptist University. He has uh, a, a degree, or what we could call it, in saxophone playing. And he has earned the black belt, second, the second, second degree, in, uh, in Taekwondo. So please do not be careful not to provoke him too much. <laughs> it could be dangerous. But nowadays he is using most of his time on research and lecturing. And he is especially known for being a, pro a proponent for the historic reliability of the resurrection of Jesus and the Gospels. Michael Kuhner was born in Baltimore in 1961, now age 57, and is now living close to Atlanta, as far as I have has understood. <clears throat> Michael Kuhner has written several books, among others, The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus from 2004, uh, together with Jerry Havons, and The Resurrection of Jesus a new historiographical approach in 2010. It's a big book, a large book, 700 pages, and it is actually his doctoral thesis. Michael Kona is regarded as one of the leading proponents in the world for the historical reliability uh, of the resurrection of Jesus, together with known scholars as N.T. Wright, and Jerry uh, Havons. Uh, but notice the subtitle of the book, the, the Resurrection of Jesus, a new historiographical approach. Only very few historians has investigated the accounts of the resurrection of Jesus, but a lot of biblical scholars and philosophers has done so. What is special for Michael Kona is that he is using the methodology uh, of a historian and that he states that he from historical arguments can trust the reliability of the resurrection of Jesus. Another important book from the hand of Michael Kona is Why are there different 
dat is in de Kaspers. Except from his academic career, Mike Kona is a well-known lecturer on apologetic uh, topics. He has lectured on more than 100 university campuses and has appeared on numerous television and radio programs. He has debated. He has uh, debated leading critics uh, of the reliability of the New Testament, among others, uh, Bart Ehrman. But in an interview, Michael Cohen tells that he does not at all view his opponents as enemies. But Ehrman, among others, he estimates as a friend. When we focus on the resurrection of Jesus, uh, it contains a major part on the philosophy of history and on historical methods. He debates if historians should at all investigate claims of miracles, and he investigates the different hypotheses concerning the resurrection of Jesus using historiographical methods. The mentioned book, The Resurrection of Jesus, has caused some debate among evangelicals in the US concerning the understanding of Matthew chapter 27, verse 51 to 53, which tells us that um, at the death of Jesus, some dead people rose from the grave from the tombs. This debate has made Michael Cohen to resign from his position of two known uh, institutions connected to the South State Baptist in the US. But he has, uh, on the other hand, been given support from several well-known theologians and apologists, uh, among others like Craig, Craig Blomberg, uh, Paul Kirkman, and John Harper. The question is whether the text of Matthew, those two, three verses from the beginning, was meant to be historical uh, accounts or not. For Michael Kirkman, this question, these verses, are not that what is important is, did Jesus really rise from the dead? And this is the topic for tonight's lecture. So, very welcome and thank you for coming to us, Michael Kerman. acoustics in here. <laughs> All right, you can hear me now? Is that better? All right. Oh. Hey, thanks for inviting me here this evening. It's, it's wonderful to be here. This is, as the professor said, I my first time in Denmark, and this is wonderful. I'm just enjoying being here, and uh, I always enjoy coming to Europe, and uh, you know, my wife said, are, are you interested in going to England? I said, nah. Um, but I, I wanted to come here, and I wanted to come to uh, Sweden. So, but I want, to go to, <laughs> I want to go to Norway, you know, at some point, because I hear it's just beautiful. So, but thanks. Um, anyway, uh, let me tell you a little about myself that he, he did not cover. Um, I became a Christian at the age of 10, and um, I didn't really grow too much as a Christian during my teen years. Uh, I ended up going to a Christian university where I was a music major, as you mentioned. Uh, and it was at that time that I became real interested in spiritual things. So I was reading the Bible. I got up to the point where I was reading the Bible a couple hours a day, and I was praying. Uh, by the time I graduated from, from college, I was praying probably an average of two hours a day. And, and I know that's just strange for a college student, but I was really interested in growing in my relationship with the Lord. So, uh, I, 
decided that I wanted to get more in depth with Bible study. I wanted to go into ministry, I wasn't sure what kind. And so I enrolled in a Master of Arts degree in New Testament studies, and I did that primarily because I wanted to learn Greek. I, I took a, a semester of Greek as my last elective in my last semester of, of college, and I loved it. And I wasn't all that smart in college. In fact, I, I do have a learning disability, ADD, uh, which means attention deficit squirrel. <laughs> I really could not concentrate that well when I was in school. Uh, my dad tells me I have an average IQ. I would share the number with you, and I forgot it. Um, but in all, serious, all seriousness, I have an average IQ, and I did struggle with ADD until I found out that there's some medication to help me with that. <laughs> um, but I struggled all throughout school. I was a C student. Um, but I really wanted to, to learn Greek so I could read the New Testament in its original language. So I took Greek my final semester in college, and I got an A in it. I just, I just loved it. I couldn't get enough of it. So I decided I wanted to go for a master's degree in New Testament so I could take all these Greek courses. And so um, I went into the dean of the grad school, and I said, hey, I want to get into your master's program in New Testament and, and study Greek, really did a lot of Greek. And he said, uh, all right, and uh, so how much Greek do you have right now? And I said, well, I have one semester. He says, well, you need three before you get into that program. Okay, uh, and what's your major? Music, well, you really needed to be a religion major to get into it. And what was your grade point average? And I said, uh, 2.9. <laughs> and he said, uh, well, you need at least a 3.0. Uh, I'm sorry, you just don't qualify for the program. And I said, well, I understand, but I, I really want to learn. Is, is there a way that you could give me a chance? And he said, I'll tell you what, you go home this summer after you graduate, and you take a year's worth of Greek. There's Moody Bible Institute, and this was back in 1983, okay, before some of you were born. And uh, you could do a distance learning course. They would send you these audio cassette tapes. Some of you will remember those. <laughs> audio cassette tapes and there was no internet no email and you listen to these uh, no com uh, basically computers were coming out at that point and you write the answers and you send it in through the mail and if you do well we can give you credit for it so I took a whole year's worth of Greek over the summer that way and I got A's on it and so I came in and I took my Greek entrance exam and they told me I scored higher than anyone in the history of the school on that exam at that point and it wasn't that I was smart. Obviously, again, I had an IQ, uh, average IQ, I had a learning disability, but I had a strong desire to learn. And that strong desire, accompanied by discipline, can overcome a lot. Uh, so I got into all these Greek classes. I took as many as they would let me. I took a total of 10 graduate level courses on Greek and um, aced all of those and finally finished up that, uh, my coursework. But my last semester in grad school, I, I started to have doubts whether Christianity was true. And it wasn't anything I'd learned. It was, how do I know it's true? I was born in a Christian family. Maybe that's why I'm a Christian. What if I'd been born in Afghanistan? Would I be a Muslim? What if I'd been born in India? Would I be a Hindu or China? I'd be, would I be an atheist? Is the reason I'm a Christian because this is the way I was raised. And I think I've got this relationship with God, but people of other religions are every bit as convinced about their views as I am about mine. Maybe I'm just brainwashing myself. Um, I thought I had this intimate relationship with the Lord, but people brainwash themselves, convince themselves all the time. Maybe that's what's going on with me. And I only knew about the Christian view, and I'd spoken with Muslims, and I told them they're wrong without even really knowing what they believed. <laughs> Um, so, I'd want them to be open-minded to my view. Of course, they'd want me to be open-minded to theirs. And anyway, I'm starting to have all these doubts. And I'm thinking, how do I know if this is true? And then someone introduced me to Gary Habermas. I've never had him for a course, but he was a philosophy professor. And I knocked on the door, and he invited me in, and he said, uh, what's up? And I said, well, I have a roommate. He's got you as a professor, and I'm doubting my Christian faith. And he said, come to you. He said, well, sit down, Mike, and don't feel embarrassed about this. I got students all the time doing this. And I was like, okay. So uh, what's, what's bothering you? So I started to share with him, and he gave me some answers about the resurrection of Jesus, and I got pretty excited about it. 
And I walked out of that office and all my doubts were gone. And then I finished school and went home, back to my hometown, and started to share my faith with non-believers, and they'd bring up all these objections I'd never heard before, and it's like, whoa, is, is that true? And doubts came back. And so I'm wrestling with these for years and trying to find answers. And then, uh, so I, I get excited about it, and then one day I, I, I realized, you know what, I've been seeking answers just to confirm what I already believe. <laughs> Is that true research? Um, if, if Christianity is not true, wouldn't, wouldn't I want to know that? Um, I don't have to fear the truth. If Christianity is not true, I want to know that so I can stop believing it and go find out what's true. And, I mean, this possibly means eternity. Now I'm where I'm going to spend it and how I'm going to spend it. I mean, if atheism is true, I don't have anything to worry about anyway. Life is meaningless, and I'm going to waste my life no matter what I believe. If Hinduism or Buddhism is true, well, then I'm going to get many chances to get it right. <laughs> um, but what if Islam is true? You know, I might, you know, well, I'm going to be in a world of hurt when I die, in, in the way I spend eternity. So I, I was wanting to seek truth. And again, I, I, I felt like I had nothing to fear about truth. What I had to fear was my biases would get in the way so much that it would prevent me from discovering truth and cost me eternity. That's what haunts, haunted me at night. And so I decided I got in a, a PhD program. I never thought I would ever do that. But I got into a doctoral program and worked my best to, to minimize the negative impact of my personal biases. It's hard to do that. You have to make a you have to make a deliberate effort, and it's got to be a consistent effort. You just I found that if I made the effort and I got to the point where I could be neutral and then moved on, I would come back to my biased position because that's just the natural point. So when I was doing my historical investigation on the resurrection, I found that I had to do my best to detach myself and say, okay, I believe this is true, but I, I do things to like, all right, well, it, if it's not, what, what can I do to minimize art? Well, I, I'm a leader right now in the largest Protestant denomination in North America, and if I find that the resurrection did not occur, I could quit my job, write a book against Jesus, and become wealthy. So, um, so I, I would do these things to try to say, okay, well, I, I got to be unbiased here as much as possible, and I, I've set up things, put six uh, controls in place to help minimize my bias. And then during my whole process, which took five and a half years, I uh, intentionally gave, engaged in public debates with some of the leading skeptical scholars in the world. Because I figured I've got my biases, they have theirs, their biases is, are in the opposite direction. So, and they're smarter than me. So if there's some holes in my arguments, they're more likely to find them. And so before my debates, I would pray. God, if I'm wrong, show me. I don't care if you have to humiliate me. I just want to know truth and follow truth. And I'm going to be open, open-minded with what I want. So um, I, I pursued that way. And uh, so I think this afternoon was my 31st debate. Um, they become a lot of fun now. I, I just enjoy them. Uh, and I've become more convinced than ever that Jesus actually rose from the dead because the evidence is really good. It can withstand the toughest critical scrutiny. So, as a professor remarked, I, I've written a, a book, my dissertation was published with some minor alterations and um, 700 pages, and so uh, we're gonna go chapter by chapter tonight. <laughs> page by page, so. If you have a babysitter, just say it. it'll be a while. Actually, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna do this fairly quickly, and I'm gonna make it so easy that even a Baptist can understand. <laughs> so. Um, so let's talk about this. And oh, I also want to say so. Denmark is a great place to to to, to go. Very interesting, um, and I get to go to a lot of different places that are fun. Last year. Uh, Palm Sunday, I got to return to my home church where I used to live in Virginia Beach. So my wife and I went back and visited. 
and the pastor, Michael Simone, and his wife. Um, where's the power? Oh, okay, there we go. So, uh, after speaking at church on Palm Sunday, they invited us to this really nice Italian restaurant. Best Italian restaurant I've ever been to. It, it was just fantastic. Okay, thank you. So, it was really good, great food. I remember I had linguine and spicy marinara sauce and big ocean scallops. Oh, so good. So we're sitting there at the table talking. And at one point, the pastor says to my wife and I, uh, did you guys ever watch the television series Lost? Now I realize I'm in Denmark, I'm in the US, but I don't know what you guys watch over here. But anybody ever see the television series Lost? Oh, okay, great, lots of you. Uh, well, my wife and I did not watch that when it was on. But after all the seasons were done, we had a Lost marathon. And we just, for maybe a couple of weeks, every night, we would just watch three or four episodes until we got through everything. We were just hooked on it. We said, yeah, yeah, we really loved it. And he said, uh, well, do you remember the, play, the, the, the character John Locke? He was kind of a uh, short, bald guy, muscular. Uh, he was a good guy. He had been paralyzed. He got his legs, and then he became the smoke monster toward the end. And he said, yeah, yeah. He said, well, he lives here in Virginia Beach. And then he leaned forward. He said, don't look behind you, but he's sitting in the booth right behind you. I said, oh. Well, people like entertainers, actors, I, I've never been really like, oh, it just doesn't do anything for me. I thought, well, that's kind of cool. But I, anyway, I'll make this story short. Within the next two minutes, I had my picture taken. So, <laughs> we, uh, we, I, I get to go to some cool places. So, all right. So, the resurrection of Jesus. Um, so, the resurrection of Jesus. Why, why is this important? Well, when you're looking at it, it, it the different worldviews, you say, well, how do I know it's true? What are the truth tests that these worldviews give? When you look at Islam, on three occasions, the Qur'an says that if you want to know if Islam is true, create a surah, a chapter like one in the Qur'an. So here you go, one of those texts. If you are in doubt concerning what we have sent down unto our servant, then bring a surah, a chapter like it, and call your witnesses apart from God if you are truthful. So, again, read the Qur'an, Surahs are chapters, they're arranged not like a, a gospel, they're not like a long story, a narrative, they're more like the Psalms, they're not related in any way. And it starts off with an introductory surah, and then it goes from the longest down to the shortest. So the last dozen surahs in, of the 140, 114 in there, the last dozen surahs are, are very short. And so, just look at one of those. So I thought, oh, it, so that's a, it, it says try to create one like this and you will find that you're unable to do it and it will convince you that the Quran is divinely inspired. So you're like, well, let's try to take this test. So let's look at one of these surahs. Surah 111. May the hands, uh, are, so Abu Leha was one of Muhammad's uncles and he was a very wealthy uncle. He was the wealthiest of Muhammad's uncles and he opposed Muhammad. So that's what the surah is about. It says, may the hands of Abu Lehu perish. His wife avail, uh, his wealth avails him not, nor what he has earned. He shall enter a blazing fire, and his wife, carrier of firewood upon her neck, is, um, is a, a rope of palm fiber. In other words, your wife is, you're going to burn forever, and your wife is going to carry the wood to help burn. So that's why it's important to marry the right woman. <laughs> so this is the surah that's in the Quran. So, what the Quran is saying is try to replicate something like this. Write your own surah to see if you can come up with something as good as this. All right, so let's take the text I figured. I sat down in about five minutes, I created this surah. God will execute perfect justice on those who oppose him, but he is merciful to all who love him. Well, I suppose if I showed that to a Muslim, they might say, oh, no, 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 no. The, the Quran, when you read it in Arabic, and I, I've heard 
former Muslims who have become Christians say this. They'll say, look, the Quran, when you read it in Arabic, there's something special about it. So we don't believe it's God's word, but when you read it in Arabic, it, the language just flows in a beautiful way, in a rhythmic form. So you, you've studied Islam, so you know about it. So it, it flows very rhythmically. It's, it's beautiful in, in the way it does. Oh, okay. So well, I could do that in English. I could like put a rhythm to it, uh, maybe even make some rhyme, words rhyme with you. So how about this? Five minutes later, the Lord repays the bad and good, accords to us, by where we stood. I suppose a Muslim could say then, well, yeah, but it's not in Arabic, and Arabic is such a beautiful language. Well, is that what it comes down to? A beautiful language? I mean, is that like choosing between McDonald's and Burger King? Or is personal preference? And what if I don't think Arabic is a beautiful language? What if I like the sound of other languages better? You know, like Danish, or French, or German, not German. Um, <laughs> So what if I like the sound of another language better? I mean, really, does it come down to such a subjective test about, I like the way it sounds? So it seems to me that the test that the Quran gives on three occasions is the only test it provides to know whether the Quran is true. Um, that it can, you can easily pass this test. In fact, several years ago, some Christians got together and they created what's called the True for Khan. The Truth for Khan. Are you familiar with that? And they wrote it. It, it's, it sounds just like the Quran. And they wrote it in Arabic. And they would go on a bus and they'd start reading it. And sometimes people would walk up to them saying, and they'd go on a bus reading it, but they'd do it in a, in a Muslim country where Arabic was the primary language. And someone would come up to them and say, Oh, thank you for reading the Quran. It's so beautiful. He says, Ah, oh, but this isn't the Quran. This is the Furqan, and it would have Christian doctrine kind of stuff in it. And, and so it's like by Muslims acknowledging that it sounded just as beautiful as the Quran shows that you could create something just like it in the original language of Arabic. So it's not a very good test, I, I don't think. So then you talk to Mormons, and they come to your door. We have a lot of them in the United States. I hear you don't have too many of them here, but have them in the United States. And what they will do is they'll say, um, we know Mormonism is true because the Book of Mormon says, if you open it and they open it up in the Book of Mormon, and if, if, if you want to know whether it's true, then just read the Book of Mormon, pray and ask God with a sincere heart to show you that it's true, and he will. They talk about a burning of the bosom. I don't know how to distinguish that from indigestion, but the burning of the bosom, they, they say, God tells them that Mormonism is true. So I figured, this is years ago, I had a friend who was a former Mormon bishop, a former pastor of the church, and um, we had become friends, and we knew we were going to talk to one another at some point, and we knew that we were going to talk to one another at some point, but I think we both knew that we wanted to have such a friendship that we knew the other person really cared. We knew that we cared about each other. That this wasn't just some, you know, we're trying to, to do something so we can say we evangelize. We really cared about that person. So the day came and we started talking about it. He said, would you be open to talking to two Mormon missionaries? And I said, sure. After all, again, I don't have to fear the truth, right? And if Mormonism is true, why not become a Mormon? And so they came over, and I, uh, I, went, I went to his house, the two Mormon missionaries came over, and um, I had told him ahead of time, I said, look, I know we're going to want to talk about all the doctrines of Mormonism, and I really don't care about that right now. I want to know if Mormonism is true. I want evidence. And that's what I'm going to want to talk about. And if they can't give me any evidence for Mormonism, then I'm not interested. If Mormonism is true, then I want to know everything about Mormonism. I want to know all the doctrines and everything. But I want to know that it's true first. So I said, okay. So while they were investigating, I'm investigating. I'm calling Brigham Young University. And I'm talking to their Book of Mormon professors. And I'm asking them questions about, have, uh, uh, like, 
two of them. One guy was an archaeologist who practices up in New York, where they, many Mormons think the Hill Camara is, that's mentioned in the Book of Mormon. And another guy who practices in Central America, where others think the Hill Camara is, that's mentioned in the Book of Mormon. So I asked each of them, I said, have you ever found any archaeological evidence to confirm the Book of Mormon? And both of them, practicing Mormons, professors at Brigham Young University, Professors of anthropology, they're both Book of Mormon archaeologists, that's their profession. Both of them said no. I said, never? Nope. One guy, the guy that practices in South America, does his archaeological work there, he says, I have people every week who come up to me in church and say, have you ever found anything that confirmed the Book of Mormon in archaeology? And he says, I tell them, no. How depressing. Devoting your entire career to that and never being able to find anything to confirm the Book of Mormon. So those were some of the things and some other things I looked into. So when I came to the house and met with the Mormon missionaries, they started talking to me, I said, so what's the evidence? And they said, well, we found archaeological evidence. I said, wait, 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 wait. I just talked to David Johnson at Brigham Young. I just talked to John Clark at Brigham Young. They're professional Book of Mormon archaeologists. They told me that there's nothing, nothing. Well, the church tells us that there is. I said, yeah, you know what? And they told me the church tells you guys that there's evidence from archaeology. And he says, John Clark told me, he tells the church, stop doing that. It's not true. So these Mormon missionaries that come to your door are saying, Ar archaeologists have proven the Book of Mormon through archaeology, and it's not true. I could go on and on with that, but here's the thing. I said, look, I read a bunch of the Book of Mormon, as the Book of Mormon says, I prayed and I asked God with a sincere heart because I don't have to fear truth. And I believe God told me it was false. And they're like, well, where do we go with this? I said, look, you've been brought up Mormons, right? That's why you believe. So, so you got the Hill Cumorah, and the Book of Mormon says over 100,000 people were slaughtered on that hill around just slightly after 400, the year 400. And their bodies were left to molder and returned to the Mother Earth. That means they weren't buried. That's, that's only 1,600 years ago. If that's the case, don't you think we'd be, if we're all those bones, where we'd be able to find weapons and stuff? You know they haven't even found so much as a button on that hill? And, well, maybe God took the bones. Well, yeah, maybe he took the bones, but I mean, if you're going to do that, why not just say, well, maybe we were all just created five minutes ago with food in our stomach and move, uh, meals we never, we never ate, memories and events that never occurred. I mean, you can explain away anything like that. Do you know what? I, 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 can, I can believe something without a lot of positive evidence for it. I can't believe something if there's evidence against it and no positive evidence for it. Uh, I'm just sorry. I'm, I'm not interested in Mormonism. I, th I think this thing about praying and, believe, and ask God and he'll show you that the Book of Mormon is true, it just seems to me that's not a very good test. When you come to Jesus... When you come to Jesus, John chapter 2, people come up to him and says, Lord, or Jesus, um, what sign do you show us that you have the authority for doing these things, cleansing the temple, overturning the tables? And Jesus says, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll marry it. Uh, I'll raise it. And he said, well, it took 46 years to build this temple. But, and his, his, uh, John adds that after he rose from the dead, they realized he was talking about the temple of his body. So he gives this resurrection as evidence that Christianity, that what he's saying is true. Now that's a pretty interesting test, isn't it? It's not just read this and pray and see if you get this nice feeling. Uh, it's not just take a chapter and try to write one like this and um, yeah, it's got to be in the right language and it's got to have a rhythm and it's got to be the language that I choose. And it's up to me to decide whether, it's up to you, Mr. Muslim, to decide whether I've accomplished it. No. It's like, kill me, I'll raise my body. I'll raise up in three days. That's a, a pretty good test. Now, of course, that's good for back then. But that doesn't help us at all today, unless we can show there's a reasonable chance that Jesus actually rose from the dead. And so that's what I started to study. What kind of evidence do we have for the resurrection? So, um, it's, it's kind of like this. I heard John Meyer, he's a historical Jesus scholar who teaches at Notre Dame, and I heard him lecture once, and he said, 
No matter what you're studying in history, it's almost like you're playing a game of cards. And each card is a source. And it's like when you play a game of cards, in many cases, you wish you had more cards. You wish the cards you had were better. But you still got to play with the hand you picked out. Historians always wish they had more sources, more cards. They wish the cards, the sources they had were better. But you still have to work with the sources that you have. Okay. So, so, so what, do we, what do we do with this? What kind of sources, what kind of cards have we been given when it comes to the resurrection of Jesus? And is it sufficient? Um, when we look at our sources, probably we think that our main sources are going to be the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So how good are they? Well, according to early church tradition, Matthew and John were two of the disciples, eyewitnesses, who wrote those Gospels. Mark and Luke got their information from the disciples, eyewitnesses. So, if the church tradition is correct, if it's correct, and that's disputed, but if it's correct, then we would say Matthew and John are kings. They're eyewitnesses. So they're kings. And since Mark and Luke got their information, well, Mark got his information from Peter, that would make him a queen. And Luke, it's kind of difficult to know what he's saying. He's either saying he got his information from the eyewitnesses or he got his information from those who received it from the eyewitnesses. So he'd either be a queen or he'd be a jack or maybe he's a little beach. Either way, if the church tradition is correct, those are, that's a pretty good hand of cards. I'll take that. Now, we actually have a source that's better than any of those. And it's Paul. And he's our ace. And the reason Paul is good, number one, he claims to be an eyewitness of the risen Jesus. But the reason he's more than a king is because he was not a Christian at the time. In fact, he was out persecuting the church. He, um, he believed Jesus was a false prophet, failed Messiah, that he was leading fellow Jews astray. And so he went out, he persecuted, he arrested, he imprisoned, consented to the execution of Christians, and then he became one because he had an experience that he believed was an appearance of the risen Jesus appearing to him. And it radically transformed his life from being a persecutor of the church to one of its most able defenders. That makes him an ace. Now, here's something else that's cool about it. Paul ends up dying for his belief. He's beheaded just outside of Rome, so he so strongly believed that Jesus rose that he endured much suffering, imprisonment, beatings, stonings, uh, and finally martyrdom because of his faith. He strongly believed it. He not only claimed Jesus rose, he actually believed it. Here's something else. He knew the Jerusalem apostles. So, in our New Testament, there are 13 letters attributed to Paul. And when you look at all the scholars, New Testament scholars in the world, many of which are skeptics, um, whether we're talking about an atheist, agnostic, Jewish, liberal, moderate, conservative, Christian, it's virtually unanimous that Paul wrote at least seven of those letters. Conservatives are going to think he wrote more, liberals left, you know, uh, nobody thinks less than seven, okay? Um, and some think that there are another two letters that Paul certainly wrote. And then there's some more in question, and, and I'm not here to talk about which ones he did or didn't, I'm just saying there are at least seven letters that virtually everyone agrees on that Paul wrote them. Um, so I'm only going to use those letters so that nobody can call into question and say, well, maybe Paul didn't say that, okay? One of those undisputed letters is his letter to the church of Galatia. In chapter 1, Paul says, three years after his conversion, he went up to Jerusalem and he met with Peter, the lead apostle. Now, actually, it says there that the Greek word for meet or visiting with Peter is the term hysteresi. What English word do you think we get from that? History. You see, Paul, he wasn't a disciple of Jesus during his ministry. He knew enough about Jesus to think that he was dangerous, that he didn't believe what Paul was preaching. Um, but he hadn't been around with Jesus, so he wanted to go up to Jerusalem and find out everything about him. So who better than Peter, the lead apostle, one of Jesus' three closest disciples? He imagined sitting down and talking to, to 
to Peter about what Jesus did. Hey, Pete, when you, when, when you guys finished the day ministering with Jesus and sat around the campfire eating, I, did he have a sense of humor? What kind of jokes did he tell? Did he ever drink too much wine? <laughs> Pete, I heard that he walked on the water once. Is that true? I mean, come on, really? He did? And I heard that you, what? You walked on water too? What? <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool? Fifteen days he said he spent with Peter, history side. Chapter 2, he says, 14 years later, he returns to Jerusalem and he meets with Peter, James, and John, who caused the pillars of the church. And he does so, so it's the second time with Peter. Actually, uh, Galatians 1 says he also saw James, the brother of Jesus, too. So, Galatians 2, this is the second time he's meeting with Peter, the second time with James, and now John, the son of Zebedee, is there. And he says, I meet with these guys because I wanted to run the gospel past them that I'd been preaching to make sure I'm, I, I hadn't been working in vain all these years. Guys, I, I want to, this, look, this is what I've been preaching. Uh, I just want to make sure this is what you're preaching, right? This is the central gospel message. And uh, Paul says that after hearing him, they certified every, that what he was preaching about his gospel message was correct. Um, in other words, you know, he says they gave me the right hand of fellowship. In 21st century in the United States, it's like, fist bump, Paul. Good work, brother. Keep up the good job. Um, now, as a historian, we look at this and say, all right, Paul's saying they certified that what he says is true, but maybe Paul's lying. Um, so as historians, we look for something to corroborate things, and we get some of this with Paul. So, for example, uh, Jesus' disciples, some of them had disciples later. Peter had one named Clement, Clement of Rome, and John had one named Polycarp. Now, some of you someday are going to get married, you're going to have kids, you're going to be thinking about names, and you have a son, just remember Polycarp. Right? And so we've got letters, one letter that Clement wrote, one letter that Polycarp wrote, and, and they're both writing after Paul's death, so it'll be interesting to see what do they say about Paul. Now, if they don't mention him, that's okay. Uh, if they meant, maybe if, if Paul was lying about meeting with Peter and John, James, well then we would expect them to say something. If they're speaking about Paul, they'd probably say something negative about him. If he was telling the truth, maybe they'd say something positive about him. So let's see what they say. So Clement of Rome calls Paul the Blessed Paul, and he puts him on par with his mentor Peter. Polycarp says, and I quote, Paul accurately and reliably taught the message of truth. Paul accurately and reliably taught the message of truth. And then he quotes from Paul's letters and refers to them as part of these sacred scriptures. So this is not the kind of thing you say about Paul if he's teaching differently than his mentor, John. These are precisely the kind of things that Clement and Polycarp would say if Paul is teaching the same thing as their mentors, Peter and John. I can give some more evidence that Paul was teaching the same thing that they were, but I'll, I'll move on from here. The point I just want to make here is this doesn't prove that Paul, everything he said is what they said. What it proves, at least when we come to the gospel message, the essentials of the Christian faith, that when we hear Paul in this, we are likewise hearing the voice of the Jerusalem apostles. Now, that would be awesome then if we found somewhere in Paul's letters where he would say that he's, here's the gospel message he preached. I mean, imagine maybe some archaeologists are digging around in Jerusalem and they, they find a lost letter of Paul. Did, did you know that we don't have all of Paul's letters? I think it's Colossians. You correct me since you're a Pauline scholar. Um, I think it's Colossians at the very end. He says, and you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from my Is that Colossians or Philippians? Yeah. No. So in one of those, Philippians or Colossians, I think it's Colossians. And you, for your part, read my letter that, is, that I wrote to the church at Laodicea. Oh, what? What? Letter to the church at Laodicea. That's not my New Testament. What did they found that letter? What did they found that letter? And... I mean, 
mean, that'd be pretty cool. Um, it's like, well, should we include that in our New Testaments? Boy, what a debate that would be, right? Uh, yeah, but, you know, the early church, you got this criteria, and the early church decided not to do it, and uh, well, how do we know the criteria they used was correct? I mean, it's the Bible, it's God's Word, not the early church fathers, right? And, uh, well, should we include it? Well, they must not have thought anything, and it was important enough to do it. Well, what if we're reading through that letter, and Paul says, uh, hey, I'm writing to you because I'm understanding from Timothy, who came to me uh, and reported that there are disputes amongst you because you read a copy of the letter I sent to the church at Rome and you started to uh, fight amongst one another what we meant by predestination and election. Um, something about a guy named Calvin and <laughs> broke out fistfights and I want to clarify what I said to you. Uh, then there'd be no more Calvinists. You know? so, <laughs> so that'd be kind of cool if we, if we found a letter like so what if that letter said, I want to remind you of the gospel message I preached to you. Oh, it's like, whoa. But we could certify that whatever that gospel message is, what Paul was preaching, that's what the Jerusalem apostles were preaching. That's what those who had walked with Jesus, who knew him, who ministered with him, this is what they're proclaiming. We wouldn't even need the gospels to know what they were proclaiming about Jesus' resurrection. We've got it right here. Well, we don't have that lost letter, but we don't need it. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1, Paul says, I want to remind you of the gospel message I preached to you. And in the verses that follow, verses 3 through 7, Paul gives us that gospel message in an outline form as in terms of oral tradition. Because only about 10% of the people that they could read, less than that could write, and so they taught each other through oral tradition. And it's not like the game of whispers, where I whisper something in your ear, and I whisper something in your ear, and you pass it. And you know how the game goes, and by the time you get to the back, it's something different, right? No, they had ways to put it stylized and to make it easier to remember. And we find something like this in 1 Corinthians 15, and this oral tradition, verses 3 through 5. He says, I delivered to you what I also received. Those two terms, delivered and received, typically mean the imparting of oral tradition. And then he says this, Christ died for our sins according to well, As I say this, here's another way we know this is oral tradition. One of the ways that they would, like if I said to you, let me tell you something. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Uh, you know that this is in a stylized form because there's a rhythm and there's a rhyme to it, right? Well, they could pick up things like this too. And one of the ways they would do it is they would do something called parallelism. Long, short, long, short. So get a load of this. First Paul says, I deliver to you what I also received. I'm giving you oral tradition. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared. Ah, oral tradition. And then he provides a list of the appearances. To Peter, to the twelve, to more than five hundred. At one time, then he adds a parenthetical statement, most of whom are still alive and some have died. In other words, some of these people are still alive. You can ask them about what they saw. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles. And then Paul said, last of all, he appeared to me. Three individual appearances, Peter, James, and Paul. Of course, he got that information directly from Peter and James, whom he met with. He's an eyewitness himself. And then he's got three group appearances. To the twelve, to more than five hundred, and to all the apostles. Now the group appearances are profound, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And then Paul says, whether I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believe. Now, in English, that, that word preach doesn't tell us much at all. But in Greek, it's the word kerygma, or the verb keruso, from which we say kerygma, the official public proclamation. In fact, uh, I, when I was in Sweden, I, I asked them what their Bibles said on uh, this, because verse 1 says, 
I want to remind you of the gospel message I preached to you, and then we, so the gospel message I preached to you, and then this says, this is what we preach to you. There's two different words in Greek, one in English, and in Swedish, there are the two different words. So I don't know what it is in Danish, there's the two different words. Okay, good. Um, so, the, it's important to notice that this is curriculum here. Official formal proclamation in Paul said, this is charisma. This is what the apostles preached. This is what I'm preaching. This is what you believe. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and his appearances to individuals and groups, to friend, and even at least one foe. Now that's pretty neat. Now how early is this? Well, 1 Corinthians, we're not sure exactly when it was written, um, but probably a no later than the year 55. All right, now, Jesus, we're not certain when he was crucified. It's either the year 30 or 33. Okay, so let's just call it the year 30. This is the year 30. And then we come over here in 1 Corinthians. It's written in, let's just call it 55, the later date, earlier than the later date. So at the very most, you've got 25 years separating when this letter is written and Jesus is crucified. Paul says, I delivered to you what I also received. So he delivered it to them. Earlier than this, he delivered it when he set up the first Lutheran church of Corinth, around the year 51. And he says, I delivered to you what I also received, so he received it before then. So he received it probably no later than the year 50. Could have been at, in Damascus right after he was saved. It could have been during missionary trips in the meantime, when he was traveling with Silas and Barnabas. It could have been a trip to Jerusalem when he talked to Peter and James. Or the second one, when we talked to Peter, James, and John, we, we don't know. But he probably received it from an apostle or the apostolic party, and tradition went back to the apostles. So we're within 20 years, and it's coming from the only witnesses. That's pretty profound. So this is what we're hearing, death, burial, resurrection, appearances. Now, what do we get out of this? Paul is our best source. We're not even talking about the Gospels. We've only considered one source, Paul. He's our best source because he's hostile at the time of his conversion. He's an early source. He claims to be an eyewitness. He knew Jesus' disciples, and we can certify that he's preaching the same Gospel message they're preaching. And they're preaching, we get from these three things. Number one, Jesus' disciples taught that he was raised from the dead. Number two, Jesus' disciples taught that the risen Jesus had appeared to them. And individuals and groups, friend and foe alike. By the way, the first one, because he, they taught he was raised from the dead, it wasn't a legend that developed over time. This can be traced right back to the original disciples. You could say they're lying or whatever, hallucinating, but it's not something that developed over time. The fact that they they taught that Jesus appeared to individuals, to groups, to friend and foe alike, like I said, it's profound in group appearances, and here's why. A lot of research has been done over hallucination on hallucinations for the past more than a century. Multiple studies. Hallucinations are false sensory perceptions. You are perceiving something with your senses that's not really there. If you have a visual hallucination, you are seeing something that's not there. If it's an auditory hallucination, you are hearing something that's a sound that's not really there. There's an olfactory hallucination where you smell something that's not there. A gustatory hallucination, you're tasting something that's not there. Um, a tactile hallucination, you feel like something's touching you or you're touching something. Um, it's kind of like when you first got your mobile phone and you come to church or your class and you put it on vibrate and during the event you thought you felt the phone vibrate and you got a text message and you pulled it out and you flipped it open and said, nobody loves me. And false alarm, that's called a tactile hallucination. Most of us have experienced that at some point. Others don't experience, like, they're, they're not contagious. So it's like if I had that false alarm and didn't move, the person next to me would say, hey, why don't you check your phone? I think it just... You know, you got a text. How do you know? You know, it's not a hallucination if that's the case, right? Um, kinesthetic hallucination, a sense of motion. If you ever have a dream that you were falling and you woke up, 
That is called a kinesthetic hallucination, a sense of motion. So we've all experienced them in some sort. Um, not everybody experiences visual hallucinations. The group most likely to experience a hallucination of any sort is someone who has lost their loved one. And only 7% of them experience a visual hallucination. 100% of Jesus' disciples said they saw the risen Jesus. He appeared to them. In terms of the group hallucinations, it said they're, they're not group experiences because there are occurrences in the mind of an individual. They don't have any external reality. In that sense, hallucinations are like dreams. I could not wake up my wife in the middle of the night and say, Honey, I'm, I'm having this dream I'm in Maui. Go back to sleep. Join me in my dream and let's have a free vacation. You can't do that, right? We might both dream that we're in Maui, but it's not the same dream. We can't participate in the same dream because it's happening in our brain. No external reality. So you can't have a group hallucination. You can have a group optical illusion, but not a group mistaken identity, but you wouldn't have a group hallucination. And yet, you've got, he appeared to the 12, he appeared to more than 500 at one time, he appeared to all the apostles. Three of them. And then, what about Paul? Paul's not grieving Jesus' death. Again, he thought Jesus was a false prophet and a failed Messiah. Jesus would have been the last person in the universe that Paul would have wanted to see or expected to see. And we haven't even used the Gospels, but if we did, I'd say, what about the empty tomb? We've got some evidence for the empty tomb. If they hallucinated the, the, the appearances of Jesus, that doesn't explain how the tomb got empty. So there's all kinds of problems with the hallucination hypothesis. It just doesn't work. Oh, then the third one, Jesus' disciples were willing to suffer and endure martyrdom for their preaching. We have at least 14 sources that shows that the disciples and Paul were willing to suffer and at least were willing to go to their martyrdom uh, uh, for their gospel proclamation, which suggests that they weren't lying. They sincerely believed it. Liars make poor martyrs. Now maybe you're thinking, you know what, we hear stories about Islamic jihadists who get, do suicide uh, runs, they blow themselves up, and that doesn't mean, they're willing to die for their, that doesn't mean that what they believe is true. That's correct. We could say the same thing that Christians who die martyr deaths uh, by ISIS today and have their, their heads chopped off. Uh, because they're willing to die, that doesn't show that Christianity is true. All it shows is they believe Christianity is true. Uh, uh, Muslim jihadists, the fact that they're willing to die for Islam, doesn't prove Islam is true, but it shows they believe Islam is true. Correct. That's right. The disciples' willingness to suffer and die shows that they believe Jesus rose from the dead. That's what I'm saying. They weren't dying. They weren't lying. Well, there is something else there, though. When Christians who are, who are martyred today die for what they believe, Christians, whether we endure persecution or martyrdom or whatever, we do it for what we believe is true, but honestly, we don't know that it's true. For all we know, it's possible it's wrong. There's an element of faith. Islamic jihadists, they're dying for what they believe is true. Okay? The disciples were dying for what they either knew was true or knew was false. If, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, they would have known it. And yet they were dying for their testimony that Jesus had risen and had appeared to them. Again, liars make poor martyrs. So they weren't lying. You start to run out of explanations. What I'm saying is just from the Paul and from that one little text that we just looked at in the last few minutes, just from that, we get enough evidence to show that the disciples sincerely believed that the risen Jesus had appeared to them, that it was important. And we see it wasn't a legend, it wasn't a hallucination, and they weren't lying. And at the end of the day, the best explanation for the evidence is that Jesus rose from the dead. And I get pretty excited about that. But this guy who has doubts at, at times, 
I want evidence. I want facts. If I'm going to give my life for this, if there's a chance in the future that I may have to endure persecution, I want to know that it's true. I don't want to do it just because I like Jesus' teachings. Uh, I don't want to do it as a psychological or emotional crutch. Or just have something to believe. I've got better things. If Christianity is not true, I've got better things to do with my time and money than to come to church on Sunday. Sorry, Pastor. It's just how I feel. I don't want to come to church if it's false. And I don't want to give you any money if it's false. But if it's true, then we should be in church on Sunday. We should give money to the church. You like that? Um, so we should. We should really throw ourselves into Christianity because this is the most important thing in our life. It's going to determine eternity for us. We should follow Jesus unreservedly and be willing to give everything for him. But I want evidence for it before I do it. I think we have that evidence. It encourages me. And for practical living day to day, hey, look, many of you, I'm sure, are going through some tough times right now. Different things. Maybe some of you lost your job recently. I don't know if that happens here. Maybe it doesn't happen here in Denmark. It happens a lot in the U.S., okay, where people lose their jobs, companies downsize, and you don't fit their size anymore. Or uh, maybe you, your marriage just blew up. Or you have a relationship and that just blew up. And you were engaged to someone and now that person doesn't want to marry you and you're devastated. Or you're getting divorced or you just found out you have cancer or something. And, and it's really bothering you. Um, what the resurrection of Jesus does can do is it encourages you because it helps put everything in perspective to say, God really cares about you. He loves you. He might seem silent. I'm sure he seemed silent to Mary and Martha when their brother Lazarus dead, was dead and Jesus let it happen. It's like God always shows up late if he shows up at all. But he knows what he's doing. And he's, he's, he's working on us to mold us to become more like Christ. And a lot of times that is, his goal for us is holiness, not happiness. And so we go through this life, we become more like Christ, but the resurrection guarantees us eternal life. It tells us that we matter to God, that He loves us, and that things are going to be okay. And that's what it means to me, and I get encouraged by that. All right, so how about if we open it up for some questions? We're going to have a break? Yeah. Let's have a break first. <laughs>